Sorry, Michigan State fans, for the rough night. Aren't you glad Jesus is always king? <laughs> always number one. If you take your Bibles and open up to Matthew chapter 28, we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Um, we're in between uh, series right now. We finished up the book of Hebrews last week. We won't begin the book of Jeremiah until the 28th of April, a couple of uh, three weeks from now. Um, th this week is a week that I wanted to highlight missions especially, but I also wanted to set up next Sunday's message as well which is going to be uh, looking at Jesus' coronation as king riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Um, I have a take on that that I, I got from some uh, teaching by Ray Vanderland. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Focus on the family uh, at the World May Know video series. Um, he has a teaching on this that is absolutely astounding. Um, and this week's message hopefully will kind of prepare your hearts for, for next week, but this is a standalone message on its own. Because I wanted to highlight the Wagglers, and they're um, speaking during the Sunday school hour to the adult Sunday school classes about how they're going to Guatemala in July to uh, do, have full-time ministry in Guatemala. In fact, our mission team, the seven of us that the, the sale yesterday was for, will be visiting them while we're uh, in Guatemala, along with the Yorks, who have uh, been part of the Hillsdale community for a number of years. And so we'll be visiting them. But I wanted to highlight uh, especially uh, missions today and also the fact that Jesus is king of the universe, master of the universe, which is a part of the Great Commission from uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 that's very seldom emphasized. We're real big about emphasizing going into all the world, but we're not so big about emphasizing that Jesus has authority over everything in heaven and earth and so we can go in all the world with confidence because everywhere in the universe where we are maybe going, Jesus is already there and has authority over that. So that's why we're, uh, we're taking this look at this text, both for the Wagglers and to set up for next week. Um, this is called the Great Commission text. This in the end of Mark saying basically similar things about going into all the world. It was really interesting that George Barna, if you're familiar with him, he's kind of the George Gallup of the Christian world, and um, he did a survey in 2017, published in 2018, asking born-again Christians what it meant by the Great Commission. Only 51% had even heard of the phrase Great Commission. And I'm judging by a lot of your faces going... That you're part of that 49% 49 that may be still wondering what the Great Commission is. The Great Commission was to go into all the world and preach gospel, teaching uh, everyone everything that Jesus had said, and to make disciples. Of the 51% who had heard of the Great Commission, only 17% knew what it actually meant. That's a really, really small, small percentage of Christians that know what the Great Commission is. Well, today's message is on the Great Commission, going into all the world, preaching the gospel. And a lot of you are going, well, I can't go into the world. I've got responsibilities here at home. I've got to take care of my mother. I've got to do my job. I've got to... And that's fine. One of the really things, the cool things about Scripture, or one of the really cool things about being part of the kingdom of God, is that if you help somebody go into all the world, you're actually a missionary too. You're supporting missionaries going to all the world. So as we support the Wagglers and they have success and are racking up brownie points in heaven, <laughs> tongue in cheek, but rewards, I mean, there are rewards for doing good works. We're, as much as we support them, we're racking them up for ourselves too. And one of the really cool things that this church has about 11 or 12 percent, I haven't done the numbers here lately, of our gross income goes towards missions. Goes towards helping people outside of this congregation under, better understand the gospel. I pray that one day we'll be, be able to make it to 20%. There are some churches that are as high as 40%. Those are great churches. We're, we're still great wannabes, but we're, we're, we're on our way. So this text is, is basically talking about the Great Commission, how we need to go into all the world and not be scared doing it because Jesus is master and Lord over the universe. And so at this time, I'm going to ask...
Carol Havlin to come up and read this text for us, and then we'll talk about it. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is God's word. You may be seated. We stand for God's word to give him honor and to show uh, where the real priority is. You are seated for my words, which is appropriate. I'm only here as a voice to try to make God's word um, maybe a little better understand or maybe it'll apply it a little better. Um, Hopefully that will be the the, uh, case. If you want to pull out the sermon online, which should have been included in your bulletin, I would encourage you to follow along. There's only a couple of quotes that we're going to be uh, looking at, but uh, hopefully the the notes will make it easier for you to track along with what I hope to be able to communicate to you today about the Great Commission. The question to be answered is this. What is Jesus' underlying motivation for the Great Commission for us? What is our motivation to go into all the world and preach the gospel? I believe it's this. Jesus is master of the universe with an agenda of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Therefore, we can go into all the world with confidence. A lot of people are scared spitless to be able to share the gospel with their next-door neighbor, with their co-worker, with their roommate, with the people in Walmart, um, if you were in the Sunday school hour. Uh, why? Jesus is master of the universe, and he has promised to never leave us nor forsake us and to be with us always, even to the very ends of the earth. That should give us great assurance, great confidence that even if we're rejected, even if we're killed, it's okay. Already five people have, I'm out of here. This guy's a lunatic. Maybe. Or maybe, just maybe, I've got the greatest news in the world that sets you free even from the fear of death. That I can be more than a conqueror over everything in my universe because of Christ's love for me to set me free even from the fear of death. Word for the day is go. We need to go into the world and not fear. I I love this quote by uh, James Montgomery Bell. He says in your sermon outline, when we study the Great Commission, we notice that the word all occurs four four times. Though this is obscure in some versions, which our NAV does obscure it. Jesus possesses all authority. He sends us to all nations. We are to uh, teach people all he has commanded. And as we do, we are to know that Jesus will be with us all the days or always. We are to be the light of the world, the light of Jesus to the world. We are to be a light on a hill. We are to go into the world and shed light on darkness. I have um, some jokes. And by the way, if you wonder why I use jokes at particular places in the, in the sermon, I learned a very, very important uh, lesson from a physician here in town as I was watching him work on one of my parishioners. In fact, I knew this guy uh, fairly closely. Um, we were co-ministries at a, uh, at a particular time. And so uh, I was watching him say jokes, just non-stop jokes with a stroke victim. I'm going, that's curious. And so afterwards, when he was alone and I could talk to him in private, I says, why did you do that? And he says, oh, I have a very strategic uh, reason for doing that. I ask jokes that have different levels of, of uh, obscureness. In other words, some jokes are real easy to get and some jokes you have to really think about it to get them because by asking an easy joke and they laugh, I know that their brain is working. Then by asking a very obscure joke and they still laugh and I know they get the joke, I know their brain's working really, really well. And I don't have to spend $1,500 for an uh, EKG, one of those brain things that they hook them all up. 
I don't have to spend $1,500 of money to do this. I can do it on my own just asking four or five joke questions. And, and by their response, I'll know whether or not they're thinking properly or not. So, here's my test of you. <laughs> my light bulb jokes. How many liberal Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Ten. As they need to hold a debate whether or not the light bulb actually exists. And even if they agree upon the existence of the light bulb, they may not go ahead and change it for fear of alienating those who use only fluorescent bulbs. <laughs> How many? Some of you are still not awake. <laughs> Boom! Clear! How many atheists does it take to change a light bulb? One. But even after it's been changed, they're still in the dark. <laughs> How many Amish does it take to change a light bulb? Change? <laughs> I'm worried about some of you. <laughs> How many free Methodists does it take to change a light bulb? One. I'm sorry, five. One to change a light bulb and then four to serve refreshments. <laughs> now, the first service really ragged on me on this next one. I'm a word, I participate in praise teams, so I'm not picking on people. But how many worship musicians does it take to change a light bulb? One. He holds the bulb in the socket and the world revolves around him. <laughs> you're, you're all doing well. I don't have to worry about it. Okay, last one. How many missionaries does it take to change a light bulb? This is for you, the Wagglies. Five. I'm sorry, ten. F five. To, I can't read my own writing. <laughs> ten. Five to determine how many can be changed by the year 2020. Four to raise the necessary funds. And one to go find a national to do the job. <laughs> And the waggers are shaking their head. <laughs> okay. What directive should Christians receive from the Great Commission? One, make disciples of all nations because Jesus is master of the universe. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority over nations. All authority over governments. All authority over sickness, all authority over death, all authority over illness, all authority over circumstances, all authority over you. But he chooses not to exercise his personal authority over you because he wants you to respond to him out of love, not by coercion. And so he leaves you free to choose whether to follow him or not. If we want to eliminate the seven deadly sins in our world, which are greed, pride, envy, lust, wrath, sloth, and gluttony, it will only come by inviting Jesus into our hearts and allowing him to change our hearts and make them into what he wants us to be made into like himself. The people we were created to be in his likeness and his image. And folks, God is a master at doing it in ways that you can't comprehend. And in fact, you may think that he's leading you in a completely different direction, actually leading you away from becoming a great Christian, when in reality, he's allowing you to be tried and tested and purified so that you can be all the person God wants you to be. I'm going to do something I rarely do. I'm going to read a rather long story about David and Svith uh, uh, Flood, who were missionaries back in the early 20s uh, to um, what is now uh, Zaire or Belgian Congo. Let me read this story. It's... Uh, Rather complicated, so I'm not going to try to do it by memory. I want to read the story to you. Back in 1921, a missionary couple named David and Svi Flood 
with her two-year-old son from Sweden, went to the heart of Africa to what is then called Belgian Congo. They met up with another young Scandinavian couple, the Ericsons, and the four of them sought God for the direction. In those days of much tenderness and devotion and sacrifice, they felt led of the Lord to set out from the main mission station and take the gospel to a very, very remote area, which was much much more risky. This was a huge step of faith. At the village of Nadorala, they were rebuffed by the chief who would not let them enter his town for fear of alienating the local gods. So the two couples opt to go a half mile up the slope and build their own mud huts. They prayed for a spiritual breakthrough, but there was none. The only contact with the villagers was a young boy who was allowed to sell them chicken and eggs twice a week. Sveve Flood, a tiny woman of only four foot eight inches tall, decided that if this, this was the only African she could talk to, she would try to lead the boy to Jesus. And in fact, she succeeded but there were no other encouragements. Meanwhile, malaria continued to strike one member of the little band after another. In time, the Ericsons decided that they had had enough suffering and left to return to the central mission station. David and Svi Flood remained near Nadola to go on alone. Then of all things, Svi found herself pregnant in the middle of the primitive wilderness. When the time came for her to give birth, the village chief softened enough to allow a midwife to help her. A little girl was born, whom they named Ania. The delivery, however, was exhausting, and Sveve Flood was already weak from bouts of malaria. The birth process was a heavy blow to her stamina. She lasted only another 17 days. Inside David Flood, something snapped in that moment. He dug a crude grave buried his 27-year-old wife, and then took his children back down the mountain to the mission station. Giving his newborn daughter to the Ericsons, he snarled, I'm going back to Sweden. I've lost my wife, and I obviously can't take care of this baby. God has ruined my life. With that, he headed for the port, rejecting all of his, all of his calling and rejecting God himself. Within eight months, both of the Ericsons were stricken with a mysterious malady and died within days of each other. The baby was then turned over to some American missionaries who adjusted their Swedish, her Swedish name to Aggie and eventually brought her back to the United States at age three. This family loved that little girl and were afraid that if they tried to return to Africa, some legal obstacle might separate them, her from them. So they decided to stay in their home country and switch from missionary work to pastoral ministry. And that is how Aggie grew up in South Dakota. As a young woman, she attended North Central Bible College in Minneapolis, and there she met and married a young, young man by the name of Dewey Hurst. Years passed. The Hurst enjoyed a fruitful ministry. Aggie gave birth to first a daughter, then a son. In the meantime, her husband became president of a Christian college in the Seattle area. And Aggie was intrigued to find so much Scandinavian history and heritage there in Seattle. One day, a Swedish religious magazine appeared in her mailbox. She had no idea who had sent it. And of course, she couldn't read the words. But as she turned the pages, all of a sudden, a photo stopped her cold. There, in a primitive setting, was a grave with a white cross. And on the cross were the words, Sve Flood her mother. Aggie jumped in the car and went straight for a college faculty member who she knew could translate the article. What does this say, she demanded. The instructor summarized the story. It was about missionaries who had come to Nodora long ago. The birth of a white baby, the death of the young mother, the one little African boy who had been led to Christ, and how after the whites had all left, the boy had grown up and finally persuaded the chief to let him build a school in the village. The article said that he, gradually he won all of the students at the school to Christ. The two children then led their parents to Christ. Even the chief had become a Christian. Today there were 600 Christians, believers in that one village. 
all because of the sacrifice of David and Svi Flood. For the Hearst 25th wedding anniversary, the college presented them with a gift of a vacation to Sweden. And there, Aggie sought to find her real father. An old man now, David Flood had remarried, fathered four more children, and generally dissipated his life with alcohol. He had recently suffered a stroke. Still bitter, he had one rule in his family. Never mention to me the name of God because God took everything from me. After an emotional reunion with her half-brothers and half-sister, Aggie brought up the subject of seeing her father. The others hesitated. You can talk to him, he re they replied, even though he's very, very ill now, but you need to know that whenever he hears the name of God, he flies into a rage. Aggie was not to be deterred. She walked into the squalid apartment with liquor bottles everywhere and approached the 73-year-old man lying in a rumpled bed. Papa, she said tentatively. He turned and began to cry. Aya, he said, I never meant to give you away. It's all right, Papa, she replied, taking him gently in her arms. God took care of me. The man instantly stiffened. The tears stopped. God forgot all of us. Our lives have been like this because of him. He turned his back to the wall. Aggie stroked his face and then continued undaunted. Papa, I've got a little story to tell you, and it's a true one. You didn't go to Africa in vain. Mama didn't die in vain. The little boy you won to the Lord grew up to win that whole village to Jesus Christ. The one seed you planted just kept growing and growing. Today there are 600 African people serving the Lord because you were faithful to the call of God in your life. Papa, Jesus loves you. He has never hated you. The old man turned back to look in his daughter's eyes. His body became, became relaxed. He began to talk. And by the end of the afternoon, he had come back to the God he had resented for so many decades. Over the next few days, father and daughter enjoyed warm moments together. Aggie and her husband soon had to return to America, and within a few weeks, David Flood had gone into eternity. A few years later, the Hearst were attending a high-level evangelism conference in London, England, when a report was given from the nation of Zaire, the former Belgian Congo. The superintendent of the national church, representing some 110,000 baptized believers, spoke eloquently of the gospel spread in his nation. Aggie could not help but go up and ask him afterwards if he'd ever heard of David and Svi Flood. Yes, madam, the man replied in French, his words being translated into English. It was Svi Flood who led me to Jesus. I was the boy who brought food to your parents before you were born. In fact, to this day, your mother's grave and her memory are honored by all of us. He embraced her in a long, sobbing hug. Then he continued, you must come to Africa to see because your mo mother is the most famous person in our history. In time, that is exactly what Aggie Hurst and her husband did. They were welcomed by cheering throngs of villagers. She even met the man who had been hired by her father many years before to carry her back down the mountain in a hammock cradle. The most dramatic moment, of course, was when the pastor escorted Aggie to see her mother's white cross for herself. She knelt in the soil to pray and gave thanks. Later that day in the church, the pastor read from John 1224, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. He then followed with Psalm 126.5, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. Folks, Jesus is master of the universe. And he knows what he's doing. You may never see in this lifetime God's plan for your life. But if you follow him and die to your own agenda, one day it will become clear to you and you'll go, wow. 
I'll never forget the day my older brother died. He was 26 years old. He was eight years older than me, and he was he had taught me how to play baseball, how to kick field goals, how to kick, how to shoot. He, he was a big, strong guy. And for fun, he would pick me up and throw me across the room into the couch. <laughs> that was entertainment for him. <laughs> but for many years, I said, God. My brother was going around the country singing about you. He'd given his life to you in the gospel. Why would you allow his life to be taken by something as silly as a misdiagnosis of a ruptured appendix? It wasn't until several years later, and I started to hear from the people that he had, to different towns that he had sang at, the message coming back to me. Oh, I remember when your brother came to this church. His song, he would sing, The King is Coming. He's coming for me. And that song was remembered by those people, and when they heard that he had passed away, they realized he was singing it from personal experience. That the king of the universe had come back for him and taken him to be with him. And I learned since that God knew exactly what he was doing. Because it was best for my brother. It was best for my family. It was best for the kingdom of God. It was even best for my parents. It took a long time to figure that out. But Jesus is master of the universe. Don't be an idiot and question his authority. He's a little bit smarter than you. No. He's infinitely smarter than you. Okay, number two. What directive should Christians receive from the Great Commission? We can risk everything making disciples because it's not really a risk. (laughs) Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I love this quote by uh, Michael Horton. It's in your sermon outline. The Great Commission begins with the indicative announcement. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He doesn't say no, go into all the world and bring everything into subjection to me. He says no, no, no. It already is in subjection to me. I don't think you understand. Everything in heaven on earth belongs to me. Now go, you scaredy cats. Do you know that the Scottish missionaries were required by the the sending committee that sent them to the mission field? Scottish missionaries in the 18 and 1900s were required by their, uh, I'm sorry, 17 and 1800s were required by their mission boards to pack their belongings to go to the mission field in their coffins. Because the likelihood of them dying on the mission field was that high of a percentage that you didn't use suitcases, you used coffin to make your trip. Now G19 mission group, (laughs) we're not taking coffins, it costs way too much. But we should have that mindset. That even if it costs our life, it's worth every penny. It's worth everything. Here's another joke. See if you're still with me. The first service was ready to impeach me. There was a cannibal one time and ate a Catholic priest. Some of you are way ahead of me. <laughs> and this, uh, this cannibal that ate the Catholic priest um, got an upset stomach and went to the witch doctor to find out what, what had happened. And the witch doctor said, well, how did you prepare it? How did you uh, cook it? And he said, well, I broiled the priest. And he says, you idiot. That priest was a friar. <laughs> do you... 
Some of you are still not connecting, so I'll, I'll give another one. Did you hear about the cannibal that ate the uh, charismatic missionary? Afterwards, he threw up his arms. Some of you are saying, why did we come to this church today? <laughs> to hear this, worship point, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus because Jesus is master of the universe. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus because Jesus is master of the universe. I don't care how dark it looks. I don't care how much in despair you are because of your circumstances. I don't care how much you think God has gone on vacation. He has not. And one day you will look back at your... Pre I can say it on my own personal experiences and, on, and even more importantly on the authority of God's word. One day you will look at the nightmare you are now facing and thank God for it. Because you will discover what it really did in your life to catapult you into levels of spiritual maturity and, and uh, contentment you never dreamed possible. One of the really cool illustrations from science, and I'll never forget this when I was at uh, Kennedy Space Center going through the um, different exhibits and stuff. This is, bam, 20, 20 years ago or so. Did you know that sometimes if they're doing deep space satellite la launches, that they'll sometimes la uh, sh launch it and shoot it in the opposite direction they want it to go? That they'll actually shoot it towards the sun and take the sun's uh, gravity and slingshot it out into space to gain several tens of thousand miles an hour that they couldn't have by natural propulsion. Sometimes the God of the universe has you headed in a direction you think is absolutely the wrong direction. But he's trying to get you where you want to be quicker. Don't give up on him while you're headed in that direction you think is wrong. It's not wrong. He is master of the universe. He knows exactly what he's doing. What you think is a risk by following Jesus is no risk at all. It's a certainty. Gospel application. As God, Jesus has authority over heaven and earth. But as our substitute coming back from the dead, he has authority over sin and death. If we will die to our own values, die to our own agendas, die to our will and self, Jesus will impute to us the same rights, privileges, and inheritance that he enjoys. I don't like that. This isn't good for me. I wish this would have never have happened. Those are all reflections on your will, your priorities, your agendas. And if you hear yourself saying them, little red flags should go up in your, don't let the cannibals get you, little red flags should go up in your minds, getting you to realize, I'm imposing my values on this set of circumstances. I am not thinking the way Christ thinks. I have not adopted the mind of Christ about this situation. Oh, yes. I'll just keep going then. Spiritual challenge. Jesus, who has all authority over heaven and earth, will never leave you or forsake you. And he has delegated authority to us to follow in his steps. We should live every moment of every day without fear or worry or despair. Because we know that he is Lord of all, master of the universe, and has all authority, all authority, all authority over heaven and earth. So what? If Jesus is truly master of the universe and Lord over life and death, then the only reasonable way to live the life that is truly life is when we are in, live in Christ. I want to finish with one illustration. Um, it's from a, a book called Hidden Price of Greatness um, by Ray ben Beeson and uh, Renelda Hunsicker. Hunsicker. It's about Gladys Allward. And Gladys was a missionary in China. This is about 80 years ago, just before World War II. And Gladys was in charge of an orphanage, a lot like the Wagglers are going to be in Guatemala. 
But she was one of the lone adults there, and she had senior leadership, and the Japanese were invading China, uh, China in part of their expansionist uh, empire mentality, and so they had to flee their compound of where the orphanage was, and so here Gladys is with a hundred orphan children going over mountains, trying to get into the free uh, area of China to, to keep them to safety. And after several days of making this adventure, she couldn't sleep because she just realized how hopeless it was and she just was in despair. And the next morning, she, a 13-year-old little girl realized that Gladys had not slept well and was, was really, really uh, upset about the circumstances they were in. And the little 13-year-old girl who was one of the orphans came up to Gladys and said, isn't this exciting? This is just like Moses in the wilderness. And Gladys says, yeah, but honey... I'm not Moses. But the little 13-year-old girl said, no, of course you're not Moses. But God is still God. 